All right, um, let's get going for this uh, this last message, and uh, we'll wrap up the day with this. And let me say to all of the speakers, uh, get with me when we're done so I can give you the restaurant name so we can meet there at 6 o'clock for all the speakers, okay? So... Um, We'll get that. Uh, we'll get this done, and then we'll have enough time to get um, reset. So that, um, and for everybody who knows, just trying to take the speakers that travel to to a dinner uh, for them and their spouses, um, and uh, have fellowship there for the evening. So, um, if you will turn to the book of First Thessalonians in chapter two. So. In the previous conferences that I've been a part of that I had any dealings with, we gave out topics and subjects and themes. We went to Brother Steve Atwood's conference last September, and I don't think Brother Steve gave us a topic or a theme. We went to Brother Steve's conference up in Gatlinburg in March, and there was no topic or theme. And every man brought whatever he had studied for and it was amazing how it just all went together. And can I say really and truly, we didn't do topic and theme this year, and it's really all flowing together, and so much so that between Brian and Robbie, I don't have much left. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they really went after the verses that I had. And so, but it all goes together, and that's the beautiful thing about it. So what I want to speak to you about today, my, my thing is to talk to you about the effectual power of God's Word. The wisdom of God and everything that we have in this book and what's been revealed to us and the understanding that we can have of the book when we come to God's method of studying it, when we understand how to write and divide the Word of Truth. Here's the issue a lot of people are going into the Bible and they're making divisions. God has made the divisions for us, right? So we have to learn where the divisions are so that we're not out cutting up the Bible to make new divisions and make things fit us, right? But I want to talk to you about this because salvation has been spoken about by grace through faith. Um, the hope that we have that Robbie spoke of of the rapture, it is under attack. There's no doubt about it, man. There are so many people that have come against us, uh, Facebook, YouTube, whatever it is, talking about there's no such thing as a rapture. That's something that we all made up. There is a rapture. If you want to call it that or not, as Robbie said, the Lord Jesus is coming in the clouds. He's going to call us up to Him. And He is going to catch us up to Him that where He is, there may we be with Him forever, right? So whether you believe that or you don't believe that, we're going to teach it. And we're going to stand on the doctrine of it. Right? We understand something about that. That we, as they said, we're a mystery body of Christ. It started with one man. It's going to end with one body. And then prophecy is going to resume. And God's going to go back to dealing with Israel according to their hope, according to their promises. And, and so the Bible is laid out. When you open up after Paul's writings from Philemon, it says Hebrews. Right? He gives us a clue, right? Hebrews. And from there out to Revelation, you can read about their, their doctrine, their hope, and what they've got. Well, these things that have been spoken this weekend so far, even if you are a believer, if you do not believe, if you do not by faith trust what the Word of God is saying to whom it's saying, it will not work in you. Right? You can hear that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. You can have that in your head and never be saved, right? You can believe the historical account that Christ died on the cross, was buried, and he, but you can do that and not be saved. You must believe from your heart. It gets here, it gets here. Believe it from your heart. Count it so. Trust Christ and Him alone. Make it personal, as Brother Brian said, and believe that Jesus Christ has done everything that it would take for your never-dying soul. And when you believe that gospel, how did he die for your sins, was buried and rose again, he will save you. Baptize you into Christ, into that death, and raise you up. 
Well, look here in Thessalonians, and, and let's watch this effectual power of God's Word. In 2 and 13, For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, notice closely, because when ye received the Word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth, what? The Word of God. Now watch closely. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So we have the canning of the Scripture. We have learned that the Scripture, the Word of Truth, must be rightly divided. You're going to take the program that Israel had, the prophecies, the law, you're going to separate them from what Paul was given, being the mystery revelation that God had kept secret, revealed it to the due time apostle. You're going to have to keep those things separated. It does not mean that we throw out any part of the Bible. Those things are there for our learning, right? But in order for you to have this book to make sense unto you, you're going to have to accept what God has done with the book. Now, all the testimonies in this room, if everybody I've ever talked to, whoever came to this knowledge says, now the Bible makes sense to me. Before, if you're honest, you know it didn't. Because you know it gave different instructions at different times. So when people believe the Word of God, when the Word of God is divided correctly, it is dispensed correctly, at that point we have the ability now to believe it and have it to work effectually in us. It is the power of God. The power is not in fair speeches. The power is not in this, this, this creative thing that they've got out there, the power of positive thinking. Right? That, that's feel good about yourself. You, let me say this. If you'll see your flesh like God saw your flesh, it'll help you. Right? As the man said, there's none righteous, no, not one, emphatically. There's none good. No, not one. So according to the verses, how many of us are good in the flesh? Not one of us. Now when you believe that, your eyes can be opened up to say, hey, it's not that Jesus died on the cross so that he could give me some help. What God was saying is we're totally deprived in our flesh, completely sick, completely rotten, going back to the, the maggot in the bottom of the trash can analogy, we're no good in our flesh. God wants nothing to do with our flesh. If you ever want to know how God feels about your flesh, look at a cemetery. Right? That's where He puts it. He don't want it. Right? What God is after is for you to believe the Word of God, receive it as the Word of God, and have it to work effectually in you. Right? So there's, watch, watch this in Ephesians in chapter 3. Ephesians in chapter 3. And we're, we're just going to talk about this, this po the power of God, the effectual power of God. It's in this word. And 3.7, the Apostle Paul says, Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me, watch, by the effectual working of what? His power. Yeah. Notice that. The effect of God's Word. The effectual work of God's Word. You understand? The word effectual means to have the power to create an effect. And God's Word has the ability to create an effect. Can I tell you it has the power to save you? Yeah. Amen. Can I tell you it has the power to keep you saved? Yeah. Can I tell you it has the power to take you home one day? Yeah. That's the power of God's Word. None of those things I just mentioned can be done through you and I through our flesh. Not one of them. So it's the effectual working of God's power. If you're saved today, you got saved because you heard the gospel of your salvation. You believed the gospel of your salvation and you trusted Jesus Christ. That's how you're saved. You didn't get saved by being baptized. You didn't get saved by some certificate because you showed up for a certain number of church meetings. You didn't get saved because you, I opened the door for an old lady this morning going into the uh, restaurant. That's not going to show up on God's report for me. Right? Anybody could do that. A nice guy could do that, right? A lost guy could do that. 
I'm talking about the effectual working of God's power. And there's been some conversation over the last two days. If you want to look around at our country, if you want to look around at the world, and you want to scratch your head about the condition that it's in, it's because the church is absolutely weak from the power of God's Word. We have substituted Bible translations. Amen. We have substituted the gospel of grace. Amen. We've thrown Romans through Philemon out of our Bibles, jumped over them so that we could be somebody that we're not. Amen. And the effectual working of God's power is not in most believers. They believed, as the brother had said, hell insurance. They be- There's a lot of people that are saved. Don't get me wrong. Hey, I was saved, but I was in darkness. I was saved, but I was held under a man-made religion. Listen to this. If you truly want God's Word, it's available. It's available if you want it. I'll guarantee you if you'll take the King James Bible, go to digging in this thing to see what these men have preached. Is it true? You get there, you believe it, it'll start to work effectually in you. Why? Because of the power of God's Word. It's not the power of positive thinking. I tried that one time. I really did. I said, man, I'm having some bad some bad times here. You know what I think I'm going to do? I'm just going to start doing what old Osteen said. Old Joe, he, he said, just get up and think good about yourself. I did it three days in a row. It was the worst three days of my life. He didn't do a thing for me, man. It really didn't. I'm sitting here thinking about how I'm going to be all this today and all that today. And I'm just going to be happy. And I'm going to, boy, I'm going to be nice there. But that didn't work. I didn't get past breakfast. That wore off. But it's God's Word. When you get this Word in you, there is power to do some stuff for you. And that's what we're going to hit a little bit of. Look at Ephesians in 3.20. 3.20. Now unto Him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh we're at. In us. The power. What power are we talking about? Here's the mistake that gets made. People look back at Acts 2 and that's the power they want. They want God to throw a bucket of ice water on them. They get chills. They start to jump around. They get excited. That's not the way God's working right now. The Word of God in you, that's how God's going to work. He is going to work according to that Word. But that's why Colossians says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be filled with the Spirit, right? How are you going to be filled? By God's Word. And when you have that Word in you, it will and can work effectively. Go to Galatians. Galatians, when you get there, go to chapter 2. I can never read these verses now without thinking of Les Felton. He said, men read these verses, and somehow as they're reading the verses, they forget how to count the two. Watch the two here momentarily. Watch verse, uh, starting at verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. I wonder what gospel they were preaching when Paul got up there. The gospel of the circumcision, right? Right? Now watch this. At that, because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us again into bondage. I wonder what that was. That was the law, right? And he said, to whom we gave place and subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. What's the next verse? But contrary wise. They couldn't add anything to Paul. You know why? Paul knew that program. Paul had been circumcised of the tribe of Benjamin. He knew what they were preaching. You know how I know that? He was killing them for it. (laughs) Right? 
So they couldn't add anything to Paul by what they had, but contrary wise, what God had given to Paul, he had something he could add to them. All right? Now watch closely. Here's what Les used to say. Contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, there's one, right, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter. There's two. In that one verse, you have two apostles and you have two gospels. Now, it's amazing that men can go to school for eight years and they can see the two apostles, they can see the two groups of people, but they can't see the two gospels. They, they can say, hey, there's an apostle, there's an apostle, there's a group, there's a group. No, oh, there ain't two gospels in there. Well, you just saw a gospel of the uncircumcision and a gospel of the circumcision. Can I tell you two things can't be any more different? Right? Now watch what he says. For What's the words here? For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty unto me toward the Gentiles. Two apostles, two programs, two gospels. And somehow people go, one. That two won't come to me. Right. You know, it's got to mean something different, right? I had a guy emailing me for a week and a half over Peter and Paul preached the same gospel. And so I said, brother, what did Peter preach? 238, what did he preach? Repent and be baptized. I said, the Apostle Paul said God didn't send him to baptize. That's different. Now they always fall back on what Paul was doing in the transition period, right? He did baptize some. Paul did say he baptized some. I said, but if you want to know the doctrine of what Paul preached, you can't go to Acts and find it. You have to go to his epistles and find it. So the two Gospels that were being preached here is the Gospel of the circumcision and the Gospel of the uncircumcision. And Paul says this in verse 8, He that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. God's Word and God's grace was working effectually in Paul. Even so much so, look at 9. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they where? Unto the circumcision. Right there, folks, is where the Great Commission got put on hold. Right there is where it stopped. Right there is where it stalled out. These Jewish apostles of the circumcision had seen that God was now working effectually in Paul by that grace, by that gospel they had given Paul, and they shook the hands of Barnabas and Paul that they would go to the circumcision and Paul and then would go to the uncircumcision. Can you see that? Two different programs. Well, why would you bring that up? Until you see that simple truth, the Word of God has no chance of working effectually in you. That's true. That's true. As long as you're trying to make Paul part of the twelve, and this is what the one fellow said, he said, Paul uh, was one of the twelve. He said, Peter and them jumped the gun, made a mistake, and take him a thighs. I said, brother, you ever read the book? <laughs> they prayed. They asked God to let the lot fall on the one that should take Judas' spot. I've heard them say that was gambling. Anything in the world to explain away what God was doing. Anything. Well, until you believe this stuff, it's not going to work effectually in you. All right. So let's look at some things that the, the Word of God effectually. God's Word, let's look at some things it'll do. Look at Romans in chapter 1. Romans in chapter 1. I thank God for Brother Brian's message on a grace believer. Man, that's strong. As they say down here in the South, that's stronger than a garlic milkshake. That was strong. Look here in 1 and 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it to the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Notice the power of that gospel. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. Paul is saying, I'm not afraid of it. I know it'll do exactly what God said it would do. 
It'll save anybody that will believe it. Amen. It has nothing to do with your flesh. It has nothing to do with what you can offer God, as the brother's already spoken. It is the power of God unto salvation. Now, how often do you hear that when you turn on TBN? When you turn on your local radio station? It'll always have something loaded to the back of it. It'll always have something loaded to the front of it. If you're willing to commit your life to Christ, if you're willing to quit sinning, anybody in here got that accomplished yet? It's always you do something, now God's willing to save you. No, Paul said it's the gospel. And Paul said therein that gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. It's the righteousness of God, not our righteousness. Look back over Colossians chapter 1, 13. It has the power to save you right there. Look at Colossians 1 and 13. The gospel that Paul preached has the power to deliver you. Look at this, 113. Colossians, who have delivered us from the power of darkness. It has the power to translate you. Has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. See that? Everything that we need, have needed, would ever need for our eternal souls, God is furnished through the person and by the person of Jesus Christ when He went to the cross and died and shed His blood, was buried and rose again the third day. And all man has proceeded to do is try to find a way to add something to God's righteousness. Amen? You know, there's many people sitting under a roof who have never accepted that God did it all. They won't believe it. I've got family that won't believe it. I've got to be willing to do it. No, he's done it. He's got the power to translate you. Go back to Romans and look at 12. Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. Power, the power of God in His Word. Watch closely. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Word of God, right and divided, has the power to renew your mind. It has the power to transform your thinking, to transform you. The Word of God. Be careful with transformation because there's another spirit out there. Look back over in uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 11. You better make sure it's the Word of God doing the work and not you. Look at 11, 2 Corinthians 11. And look at 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Watch this transforming what themselves they're doing the transforming there huh and to the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also be what transforms as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to works what what if if it's the righteousness of God what do you think they're preaching their righteousness anybody ever said under that program a man preaching self-righteousness, putting you under bondage? Well, the power of God, according to the Scripture, right and divide, it has the power to take you out of that darkness to set you free. Amen. You understand that? I mean, testimony after testimony of relief. Thank God I see a book that I now can have some understanding. Right? right? And then some people live in it, say they are, and then they'll turn right around and go back to their old roots. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8. And, and, and here, there's a whole, there's a great big teaching in all this, and we started this message last Sunday at our assembly about the effectual working of God's power and the four needs that a Christian has. And that is, they need to be established they need to be edified, they need exhortation, and they need the effectual power of God's Word working in them. Alright? So here in, in um, 
Romans chapter 8, I, I want you to see that the power of God in His Word, it has the power, the effectual power to keep you. For I am persuaded, verse 38, 8 and 38 of Romans, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It has the effectual working of God's Word, has the ability, has the power to give you that assurance. There's many people who claim to be saved, have no assurance or to salvation. I've talked to many people, and you have too, I've heard some say, I hope. I hope I'm going to heaven when I die. Well, I know I'm going to heaven when I die, as the brother said, because I've read it right here. I trust and believe what the Bible said about my salvation. If it hinged on me at all, I would say I doubt. Right? So go over and look at 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. And I'm like Brian, I'm going to get y'all back on track. And here's the disease in this verse right here of, of modern Christendom and religion. Verse 5, 2 and 5 of 1 Corinthians. If you want to know that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Most people who claim Christianity only know what their pastor knows. Amen? Yeah, anybody ever heard somebody say in the latter times you won't be able to tell season from season? You ever heard that? Well, that was a lie that was told as long as I can remember. I've searched the Bible high and low. It, somebody tell me, did you find it there? The Bible, what it says is the seasons will always be, right? But that lie got told and it became a truth to people and they just passed it right on down, right on down, and right on down, and right on down. And that what people get is the wisdom of man and things. They get the word of man. They hold on to it and a lie becomes the truth somewhere in their life. Yeah, right. Amen? You ever heard somebody say you've got to turn from sin before Christ will save you? Yeah. Well, that's a lie. That's a lie. How much do you have to turn from? <laughs> One brother said all of them. Good luck. If I could turn from all my sin, I probably could just not have to worry about believing on Christ, right? If I could turn from all my sin, I don't think He'd have died on the cross for us. He'd have said, you do it. So the wisdom of man, look at that real close, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Remember what we're talking about? The effectual power of God working you. The Word of God is God. The Word of God is His Spirit. He inspired this book. Amen. All Scripture. Right? And by that we have the power of God. People say, I would love to hear God speak. Listen real close, audibly. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. That's God speaking audibly. Amen. Right? Did you hear it? What is the wisdom of man? Some other way other than God's way. Some little thing that's been built to try to draw people into Him, build up a building, build up a bunch of people sitting on pews so that He can go out here and cloak about what He's done. Amen? Talk about how much money he's got. Talk about how God has blessed him with all riches. All this stuff. It's the wisdom of man. Can I tell you that the wisdom of man wouldn't take the base things of the world to confound the wise? That's God's wisdom. The wisdom of man is always looking for what? Intellect. He's always looking for a sharp dresser. Somebody that's believable in the flesh. God goes out and brings a man out of the wilderness called John the Baptist. I wonder how many churches he'd be welcome to. Yeah. Paul preached half of, his, uh, half of his ministry naked and beat up. I wonder how many times he'd get an invite to a Bible conference. Hey, Paul, you can preach the conference, but you need to put on some clothes. I don't have any. As Brother Brian said, he lost his clothes. He sank every time he got on a boat. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was killed. All that business. And he wouldn't be invited to a conference. He wouldn't look the part, would he? That's how God works. That's the wisdom of God versus wisdom of man. You, listen, if, if, if you want to take care of your sin, you know what you do? The same thing Adam did. You go out here and get you up a thig leaf religion, cover yourself up, and hide from God. But you know what God did? He slew the innocent. Shed the blood of the innocent so that he could give them his righteousness. 
That's the wisdom of God. The wisdom of man won't help you. I promise you, I've been there and done that. All it ever cost me was money. 10% of everything I own. All right? I was talking to Paul Lucas the other day. I said, you know something, Paul? The freedom of this thing came to me. I said, I found out there's two people I know for sure love me. Jesus Christ and some woman that calls me two times a day to tell me about the extended warranty on my pickup truck. <laughs> and I said, there's people that say you ought to block her. I ain't got a block her. I look forward to hearing from her. <laughs> Amen. He asked me, he said, Don, you mind if I use that one? I said, go ahead, brother. They're, they're free. I'll come up with them and give them away for free. This, this whole business about the wisdom of man, it's sickening really when you get down to it. And let me tell you the sickening part, and I'm going to be wrapping up here momentarily. I've got some family right now, and they've reached out to me because I know God is dealing with their soul about salvation. But you know what they can't believe? That it's free. They can't believe it. Jesus did it all. And all they've got to do is receive Him by faith. They have a mindset that they've got to do something in order to have Jesus to receive them. You know what did that to them? Here, I'm going to show you what did it to them. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I'm going to show you what did it to them. Paul said, don't let your faith rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. This book is powerful. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Start at verse 1. Therefore seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. In the sight of God, watch closely, but if our gospel be hid. Now, how could you hide it? Just lay something on top of it. Right? If you want to hide your Bible, just throw something over top of it. That's all you have to do with the gospel of Christ. Throw something on top of it. Throw some works on top of it. Throw some water on top of it. Throw some do good on top of it. Throw some church membership on top of it. Right? If you want to hide it, just add something to it. This, and what's, this, what's, what's the God of this world done? Right? Watch this. If it be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom, who's doing it? In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now watch what Paul says here. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Let me say this. If your gospel, if your preacher, if your pastor, if your teacher adds himself to the gospel that he's preaching, if he adds you to the gospel that he's preaching, he is not preaching the gospel of Christ. Amen. The gospel of Christ is not how you helped out. The gospel of Christ is how you were a sinner deserving of hell, but Christ died for you in due time when you had no strength, when you were without God, ungodly, deserving of nothing but the worst, He died for you. That's the gospel. The gospel is not how Jesus went to the cross to help me get better. The gospel is how Jesus Christ went to the cross to give me His life. Amen. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet it's not I that live it, but Christ liveth in me. For the life I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and He gave Himself for me. He gave Himself for me. Amen. Amen. So that He could give me His life. Amen. So that He could live His life through me. Amen. And righteousness does not come by the law. If it did, then Christ is dead in vain. Do you get it? The power of God. The power of God to save you. The power of God to keep you. The power of God to show you the distinction in this Bible that count. The power of God to give you eternal life. The power of God to take you out of this sin sick world. To give you a new body that will live with God forever. Did you know that's powerful? And you know what you got to do to get it? Nothing. Believe. Believe. That's what the Thessalonians did. And you got to believe it's the Word of God. Well, what about my conduct? What about it? If your conduct could save you, then your conduct could unsave you. If your conduct can't save you, your conduct can't unsave you. Well, that means I can just do whatever I want to. You're going to anyway. 